Chief Superior Judge testifying on S-169 and the West Committee had other um, areas of the bill. I would focus on this section. I believe it starts on the bottom of page four is the draft I have uh, as passed by the Senate. Is that what you're looking at? And it, section five talks about um, an amendment to uh, Title 13, Section 4062, reporting requirements. And it talks or it speaks to uh, a combination of a report due by the court administrator with the assistance of the Agency of Human Services. I filed a memo with the committee last week, and um, although it's not a, a big objection, because of the differing nature of the information, my suggestion was that the court would report to the committees on the data we collect and allow the agency to report. Because there's no there's no in between. It's really two different uh, areas of information that the, the bill looks for. So, for instance, on the top of page five, B one, two, and three are really court data. Uh, the number of extreme risk protection orders filed with the in the number of orders issued which is number one. And number two, the geographical data indicating the county where the petition was filed. We already uh, gathered that information. Actually, I think we already reported in our annual statistics to the uh, legislature. So three is a little bit uh, different. It says follow-up information describing whether the order was renewed or terminated. Um, again, that's data that we would have within our system and could provide that. Uh, the last uh, item called for in paragraph three is whether the subject of the order was charged with violating it under a different section. I think we can gather that data on coal by our data people. It's a little more complicated because it would probably involve some manual connection between the original order and the, and the violation of the order because it's really in two different dockets. One would be in the civil or family division, one would be in the criminal division. But um, I'm told that it's certainly possible to do it uh, with some effort. I do not see it, uh, any significant fiscal impact to collecting this data for the most part. Um, unlike some other situations, I can say that with some assurance. I've cleared it with everyone that. Um, and what, when you say. Um, in other words, so no, there wouldn't be any extra no, costs. You can no, no, because we're, we're pretty much yeah. collecting all of this data this anyway. Maybe providing it in a different format than we are now, but the data is there or can be obtained uh, without any fiscal impact. Uh, the next section, Section C, is a information uh, from the Agency of Human Services. And the type of information asked for there is certainly nothing that we would have in our database. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just lends itself to two separate reports, one from us on items B1 through 3, and C would be a separate report from the agency. Are there are there any instances where because I've seen with the assistance of I've seen I've seen that before. Are there instances where where you might have your data and your report and then just another agency gives it to you and you forward it? Sure. I mean, because I think that's what this is. In the, yeah. Yeah, and I, as I said, I don't we don't have a real strong objection to yeah. it. It just struck me that in this case, unlike some other situations mm -hmm. um, where there is some intermingling of the same kind of data, then it does make sense. But um, I, I think what you would end up with is a report probably from the court administrator. Here's our data from one through three, and then here's the information we received from the agency. So if that's the way the committee prefers to see it, there is no real objection to it. The rest of the bill really is not um, sure. uh, something that we would uh, it's essentially policy, and we would not offer a position on that pro or con. I'm certainly available for any questions if anybody has any. If not, I'm due upstairs. Okay. Thank, thank you for you. taking me first. Yeah, you bet. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Hi. 
the record, Allison Crump. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for the Department of Mental Health. Um, and I did uh, send forward a, uh, some slides. It's posted in front of the combination is right in front of you. Okay. Right, yeah, I saw it. Before I begin, it's my understanding you're looking for a brief overview on um, what AHS and um, I, I'm here because I'm the co-chair of the AHS Suicide Prevention Committee, as well as the lead for the Department of Mental Health on Suicide Prevention. So I'm speaking on behalf of um, AHS in that regard. Great. So, um, thank you. Sure. So, um, my goal today is let you know what we know and what we're doing about it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so I think most of you probably have heard this year there's been a lot of testimony on um, the rate of suicides going up nationally and how the rate in Vermont is significantly higher. Um, and so we are certainly following that state. Um, and we're digging into trying to get more specific on where our target populations, where are the problems, and where can we make the biggest impact. Um, and so as you'll see here, uh, nationally, it's the 10th leading cause of death, suicide in the nation. In Vermont, it's the 8th leading cause of death. Um, and it's been growing uh, significantly since 2008. Um, and currently, we're 30% higher than the national average. We do see a much higher rate of suicide in our male population. Interestingly, that is not necessarily um, equitable for suicide attempts. Attempts for females are higher. Um, suicide deaths for males are higher um, due to uh, lethal means used. So men are, more, men are more likely to use firearms, therefore there's more lethality with that. But they are less likely to attempt um, overall. And you'll see we have a significantly higher issue um, with males as they age. So our age is between 45 and 75. Either male or female. I, I, did, I, I never heard the stat that uh, females had more attempts, but um, so, so that's new to me, which is not a bad thing to get real information. But so, what's what's the reasonings? I know I know it's not one answer, and this is this is the answer, but there's a few reasons. Um, so, for instance, uh, women are more likely to be seek help and be diagnosed with depression, which means that they told somebody that they're having a difficult time and they uh, sought support. And so if you're somebody who's truly seeking support, you may choose a means that's more of a cry for help, sometimes we use that term, a way to show people that you need help. Um, if that's what your intention is, then you may be more likely to choose something that isn't fatal, but uh, shows your intent and goes just shy of actually um, uh, completing a suicide. There's a lot of other theories about that. Uh, you know, I could get into some of them. Some of them have to do with whether or not um, we do have a high use of substances on um, that are accompanying with attempts. So um, people who have used a substance um, in the moment are more likely to use a lethal means. So, and we have some correlations with that, but really um, it may have to do with a lot of the times it has to do with access to lethal means. So if you're somebody who has access to something that is lethal in the moment, you may be more likely to complete suicide. Yeah. Um. I don't even know what I want. I know what I want to say, but not how, I don't know how I want to say it. I, I guess uh, it still, I mean, for me anyway, it still doesn't say why people are doing it. Um, I mean, I've um, over the last two plus years, I've, I've done a lot of studying, um, you know, and mainly around middle-aged men. Imagine that, <laughs> um, with uh, with hormones with middle-aged men, and if you look at the the rates for middle-aged men, it is uh, continually goes up. And, uh, and it is very well known and documented that as men get older, their, uh, um, their testosterone goes down, which causes depression. So I don't know if, you, if, if your department has looked at any of that, is, 
as being one of the problems as far as uh, um, lower testosterone in men causing a depression, which depression is going to cause uh, more suicides. And, and I know a lot of people, whether male or female, they get treated with, with SSIs, and, but their systems don't have an SSI shortage. It's, I mean, you're bringing up a lot of interesting points. Um, I can tell you the facts that as we know them, we do have, we have data that shows that there's an increase in sadness and hopelessness across the population as a whole. Uh, some pockets more than others. We're seeing it more in our adolescents, more in people of color, more in our LGBTQ population. So we have this growing malaise. We know that a sense of sadness, sadness, hopelessness, and a loss of purpose and meaning in your life is one of the major factors in suicide. So there's that population. And then there's the life crisis. Someone who's hit a point in their life, financial, legal, uh, men in our culture sometimes bear the brunt of that, especially at this age group, um, so that can be a factor. So you've got someone who's facing a life issue that they can't see themselves in their way out of. So those are sort of two separate groups that we take a look at to see. And the second group is where we're trying to promote uh, that sense of give it time, uh, these things will pass, uh, but a life crisis sometimes can make somebody uh, make a decision in the moment that uh, could end their life. We also heard this morning that the veterans' suicides are way up, correct? Did we not hear that on the floor? I believe we did. So is that, are they also figured in in your calculations, sir? Yes, we have specific data on veteran suicide. Um, it's not in this slide deck, but I could send it to you. Um, in fact, it's, it's actually in the slide deck, it's just hidden on this one. So um, I can make sure that Mr. Bailey has that for you all. Okay. But it is an issue, it is an increasing issue, um, nationally and in Vermont. So, and around veterans, I didn't even give it a thought, there's a lot of veterans who are in, in a war zone and uh, just explosions alone can, uh, I mean, tra traumatic brain injury isn't, uh, uh, isn't what it used to be in, in the sense that uh, uh, it, it's a lot easier to, uh, it, to get a, a traumatic brain injury than people used to think it was, kind of like the autism thing where it's, there's a whole new scale to it. And <laughs> I'm going to keep beating the same drum here, but traumatic brain injury can cause a reduction in test testosterone. Um, the other pieces that I wanted to let you know, we do look at means. So when I'll give you, in my background, I was a crisis clinician for years, so I met with a lot of the adolescents uh, who were suicidal. So we talk with families about access to lethal means, including what medications do you have in your cabinets, um, all of that. And so when we're looking at um, the means for suicide, we do have, it's about 55% firearms, 20% suffocation, 18% poisoning, um, and 7.3% other, um, which is other types of self-harm. Um, and it does increase from 10 to 19 year olds, we're up to 59% um, with firearms for that population. Um, and we do know a little bit about those age groups as well. So we use youth risk behavior surveys to get a sense of how our adolescents and young adults are doing in Vermont. Um, and we are seeing an increase in sadness and hopelessness, like I mentioned. 25% of adolescents are reporting feeling sad or hopeless in the last two weeks. Uh, we also um, know that that uh, percentage goes way up for, it goes up almost twice for females and more significantly for people of color and for our LGBTQ population. Our older adults, are less likely to be diagnosed with depression. Um, they are more likely to have a physical health problem if they've died by suicide, um, and more likely to have used a firearm three times as much. And other factors that come into play are legal problems, substance use problems, or a recent relationship argument, things like that. So I'm going to get into the what are we doing about it portion here. Uh, we do have at the Agency of Human Services a uh, we have a committee, but we also have a suicide prevention coalition that we support. Um, the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center organizes this for us. They do a lot of work across the state and bring tons of people together. So here's where we have our 
folks from education, we've got primary care in the room, we've got substance use in the room. Um, we also invite um, people who can help us understand our target populations better. So how do you approach this with a youth who's got gender identity issues? How do you approach it um, with someone with a mental illness? And how do you talk with older Vermonters? So this coalition meets quarterly, um, and we're working to address these issues on from a multi-pronged approach. And then, as I said before, I'm the co-chair of the AHS Suicide Prevention Leadership Group. I co-chair that with Tracy Dolan, who's the Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. Um, and I point that out because as the Department of Mental Health, it makes sense that I'm the one speaking about suicide prevention, but actually, um, of the deaths in Vermont, only 30% uh, have been seen by a mental health practitioner. So the majority are not coming in through the doors um, asking for help or being treated for depression or other mental illness. So we've really been reaching out to see where, where are they going, does anybody know, you know are they speaking to other providers? Um, and so we've brought together all of the departments within AHS to talk about that and, and figure out how to approach this. So our goals for this year are, we do the F34 legislative report, which is where we bring back um, uh, to you all, what do we know and what do we recommend? And so in January, we'll be coming back with that report. It will be the third year. Uh, we also are implementing zero suicide, and that is a public health approach. It's a framework for how to deal with suicide prevention in a state, and it's got lots of um, facets to it. So yes. You're coming back to the third year with the report, you said? Yes, so we've so done what, two so far. What, what new programs and preventions have been put in place the last two years? <coughs> Since last our rates have been going up to, was it 08? Yep. So uh, some things that have been done, we've got three pilot regions in the state that are trying out a more um, intensive approach to zero suicide, where we're training staff on how to do collaborative assessment and management of suicidality. So if you think about it, we want to make sure everybody knows and is aware that this is a problem, right? And so we go to schools and we train them. Um, and I'll show you actually coming up. Um, yeah, actually, if you want to. Um, go through your slides or, or, or just okay yeah, yeah I'll, I'll do that and then I'll get to your yeah. point okay um, and the other big piece to know <coughs> is we have uh, there's a lot of data right that's really hard to manage and so AHS is directing the data surveillance group to collect this data from the various places to come together to get a full picture of what's going on and so we do that through the national <coughs> death reporting system and that's where we can know, um, we've got the chief medical examiner who will let us know if there's a suicide, and then we collect data on that. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we also got the risk behavior survey um, and hospital discharge data that let us know some other pieces to complete that puzzle. We are looking to continue the funding for the NVDRS, it's something we've been working on, and it looks like that's, that is going to happen, so we should be able to continue to get good data on this issue. Um, but coming back to the zero suicide framework in Vermont, there's multiple facets and basically what we're saying to everybody is there's a place for you in this continuum um, in <coughs> the work that you do, where do you best fit? So at AHS, we've got leadership buy-in. Uh, we want to know what are the goals, what are going to be the recommendations back to the legislature, what are the big picture pieces that we're working on, but then we've got our workforce. So we're working on training everyone from what we call gatekeeper trainers, which are your community members, your teachers, uh, people who interact with others but aren't mental health professionals, to how, how would you know if somebody might need a referral to a professional. So we're on that level, and then the next level up is, say you do make that referral, maybe they go to their PCP first, maybe you just get them in that door. How do they know which questions to ask? And then the next level up would be if you get to your uh, mental health practitioner. How are they trained specifically in addressing suicidality, which is different than treating depression. Um, there's other skills that are involved. Um, and so then from there, we might need to go inpatient. But we really try to manage these issues on the community level. We find that that's where they may be best served unless it's really an imminent issue. So what we've done uh, DMH invests. Uh, we give 191,000 in our uh, in a yearly grant uh, contract to Center for Health and Learning, 
and they've done a lot of the work with the schools, they do the trainings with our um, uh, counseling and staff in our community mental health agencies. They're also now reaching out to the healthcare providers, so they're out there getting trainings um, for some of our blueprint um, and people who are in the healthcare industry to get them aware and figure out how they can be part of this as well. So that's where the bulk of the money is going. Um, Department of Mental Health, or Department of Health also invests in the You Matter trainings in schools. And then Blueprint's starting to get on board um, to have them come in and at least start the process with getting them up to speed. This is basically what we've done in 2018. So we have 1,971 people trained in some capacity um, over 2018. Um, and I'll point out, when I talk about the ground level, mental health first aid at the ground level, I don't know if many of you have heard about mental health first aid. It's pretty fantastic. Um, it's for anybody. So basically, can we talk about what are these diagnoses when you hear about them? What is depression? What is bipolar? What is, and then how would you know if your neighbor, your uh, coworker, what are signs, and what are the resources in your community? So it's a basic ground level um, approach. And then new matters in the schools and then we have cams and cams was the one I was talking about where that's where if you do have a loved one and you get them where you think they need to go how can you be sure that the person they're talking with knows what to do about it um, and so we've really been working to get evidence-based practices for suicidality um, with our providers and that's what cams is cams is the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality and I have a slide on outcomes with it, and it's been really, really effective. And so the next step for us is we've been piloting that in three regions, and we're looking to expand. Um, and then the other is COM, and that's counseling on access to legal means. And that's where we're helping providers just have a reasonable, rational discussion with whomever's going through a difficult time on what do they want to do about their access to legal means in that moment. Should they have a family member <coughs> hold on to their weapons? Should somebody hold on to their medications? Um, those are conversations that they can have within their own you know, rights and wants um, and wishes to figure out how to keep them safe during a period of time where they're having a crisis. And so this is a two hour free online training about how to have that kind of discussion. Um, this is just to let you know what you matter is. It's a nationally best practice and it's going very well in our schools. Um, at some point you could bring education here to talk about that. But we do have some great results on it where um, from our surveys of people who have gone through it, they really do feel. We do it for youth and for the school providers um, and school personnel. And both feel that they now, there's a lot of nervousness, right? Like we're telling everybody you should ask, you should care about this, this is the problem. But what if somebody actually walks up to you and you're a science teacher and they tell you that you know, they're feeling suicidal? We're finding that if they go through the You Matter training, they at least know the first three things to do. You know, they can get them to the next place they need to go. And for youth, it's been a real, real benefit as well. And then CAMS is the other thing we've done, and these are the um, outcomes for CAMS for our providers, where they're finding that they feel much more confident in treating suicidal patients than they did before. And then the last piece would just be letting people know about their resources. There is a Vermont Crisis Text Line. This got at a population that we think we were not necessarily serving before. Um, as many of you know, sometimes it's easier to say things over text than it is to have a real conversation, especially for some generations. And so uh, we are getting uh, huge hits on our text line um, over the past year. You can see it's gone up and up and up, um, and we do have you look at the majority are, are texting for relationship issues, but 28% are reporting um, issues with suicide when they text that line. Excuse me, can mm -hmm. I just ask a question about that last chart? Active rescues, um, can you tell us what that is? Those are the number of people who we needed to dispatch someone to be in person with them to assess them for care. So most of the time when somebody texts, it's ends up being nothing that someone needed to respond to. 911 wasn't called, police weren't responding, crisis wasn't responding, it's just a conversation. So active rescue means that they had to send someone out to the home for a wellness check, which usually is police. On occasion it might be crisis if they know the person, um, but that would be something that had to be done in person. And 
the last is just some, we've got some feedback about how zero suicide implementation is going, and this was to help show that where we're doing, where we do have zero suicide in the three pilot regions, it's going very well. We're getting a lot of really positive feedback about it. Um, and so we are hoping to expand that. And then we've got our resources in Vermont, which I do want to highlight. There are <coughs> specific resources for veterans and for our LGBTQ population. Um, who both have reported that sometimes it's easier to speak with somebody who knows their culture and where they might be coming from. I, I had one on uh, some of the graphs you had earlier, specifically the one on um, page three. Uh, just understanding what the numbers mean. Are these percentages of successful suicides or uh, percentages of suicide, uh, suicide attempts? Suicide uh, deaths. Well, this one. I'm talking about the, the one below this. Page three. Um, this one? Right. Yes, these are suicide deaths. Okay, so. So, attempts would be um, what the data we have is there could be 25 attempts up to one death. So, every time you see a suicide death, you can assume that the numbers in Vermont were 25 times that for attempts. So, <clears throat> this, it, this graph is showing only those who died by suicide. Oh, and these are percentages of, or are these numbers? These are rates per population. Higher rates of suicide, yep. Per, per what, 100,000? Yes, what? per 100,000. Okay, so it's 39.1 successful suicides per 100,000, 65 plus or all. I think that's it. So is it fair to say that we're doing a lot more uh, training to prevent suicides. There's a lot more knowledge. There's a lot more help out there that's available to people, but they're not taking advantage, so the suicide rate is still very high in Vermont. I think it's fair to say we're doing a lot more to help, and there's people we're not reaching yet. And any idea of what, what the magic potion is for? You know, my magic potion would be that everybody check in on one another. I think it, it was before us, there was this assumption that if somebody uh, died by suicide, there must have been this long-standing mental illness that the person just decided not to get help for. And what we're finding is there are times where someone might struggle through a mental illness for a long time and not seek help, but there are also times, especially with our adolescent population and our older male population, where a life stressor crisis happens and the person just doesn't feel that they have the resources and doesn't want to bother somebody. There's a, there's a few factors in that. And so um, what we're doing next with that is the one place people do seem to go without stigma is their primary care physician. Um, and so allowing them to start asking that question, uh, we found that the majority of people who died by suicide um, did see their primary care within the last 30 days. And so, that's a powerful statistic. We don't think that there's a cause to that. It's just that they're more likely, especially because we have an older population dying by suicide, to be seeing their doctor. So maybe somebody who has no stigma attached, which unfortunately mental health providers still do, it's still it's perfectly okay to go see your primary care physician and tell your buddies about it, right? And so uh, trying to get that, uh, that conversation started in a different venue, that might help people also putting mental health providers in those settings so that someone who might be worried about going to see a counselor or a therapist and might have thoughts about what that means for them, if that person just walks into the room after you've seen your doctor and talks with you, that, that might help get the ball rolling. Yeah, um, it's around some of the training and the programs and that type of thing. Um, I just scanned through real quick and it's impossible to count how many programs there are. You might know off the top of your head. But I just kind of, just from what I heard, I'm not saying that's what you said, from what I heard, <laughs> that I heard you say youth a lot more than you mentioned the older population as far as these programs go. 
and I, and I think I'm I'm probably on maybe not spot on but I'm on with that uh, that there is uh, more programs for youth and um, and maybe more opportunities to interact with them <clears throat> but then I look at that graph and I, it goes through my mind the programs are more geared around the youth but the suicides are more around the older population I'm not suggesting that you take any programs away from the youth but to me, that points out there's a lack for the older population. And I, I think in, in one place that there is, is, I mean, you know, if people go to their health care providers, which I think is a great thing, I've heard, uh, I've had some people say to me, I went to the doctor today, he asked me if I was suicidal. You know, so it, it is, I don't know if it's working, but it is being asked anyway. <clears throat> but, and, and I'm, you know, I know it's a tough, touchy subject, but I'm going to go to the blacks. And, um, you, you know, they had uh, 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 the young gentleman's uh, guns locked away. So, uh, um, you know, this isn't easy for me to say to, to bring up this stuff because it's such a touchy subject. So the parents knew there was probably an issue of some kind since they, they did have his personal guns locked away. And so, if to me, if the state was geared more toward a little older population and there was more information out there for uh, family members and loved ones would some of these be thwarted that way you know when I think about your point I immediately think to the fact that one of the reasons why we are we have so many things geared towards youth is because we have a place to go to get their full attention we have a school and so that becomes a place to go to reach an entire population. And so it's easier, not just easier, you know, it's effective, where we don't have one place that all older adults go. And in my opinion, looking at those numbers, uh, youth is underfunded too. Yes, yep. So, so can you tell us again what, um, what you are doing for the older population? Yes. The SASH program has started, uh, and Unfortunately, that's not on here as well, but I can give you, we actually have a lot of information about what SASH has started, which is a program that um, works with older, the older adult population. And they did start home visiting and screening older adults um, for suicidality. So this, what, um, this is what, this is you? Yes, and you're gonna ask me a question that I'm gonna bungle because I'm not from the Department of Health and I don't know it off the top of my head and I should. Um, but I could get that for you, I actually sent it your way. I just don't have it in front of me. Um, but it is uh, through the Department of Health, and it uh, does target um, seniors. And so we're, some other things, um, Blueprint for instance, Blueprint for Health, which does work with an older adult population. But we are looking for, one of the questions we have that we're asking ourselves, ourselves is where is one place that um, older people go? You know, is, any thoughts? So, uh, I mean, for what it's worth, since you threw it out there, um, maybe the question could be turned around rather than there be one place, but looking where, uh, to your point earlier about people looking out for each other, and I just happened to have a couple weeks ago gone on a 70 mile wheels on meals drive around, and we were talking about the most vulnerable, <coughs> isolated people. And, you know, I know that the, it's a completely a volunteer-run program, and I don't know what sorts of things we're already piling on top of people who step up to do that really challenging work already. But for what it's worth, I was just astonished at what important touchstones. Sometimes these were the only people that those at home, those seniors saw. And it's not even necessarily seniors, it's people who have been through a distress that stranded them from their regular life and they can't be participating as they used to. So that would suggest to me that they're already kind of more vulnerable, not to mention isolated, et cetera. Yes, I completely agree. And I think that sometimes a person wants to be reached out to from someone who's not necessarily just a professional. People are, you know, when I listen to, if you ever get the chance, there's this great speaker, Kevin Hines, and he uh, decided to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge 
and he survived. And he talks about the second he let go of the railing, he changed his mind. Um, but it was too late, so he spent the whole way down trying to figure out how he could land to not die. And he shattered his legs, but he can walk now, and he survived. And he talks about his experience that day, and he always said if one person had just come up to me and asked, are you okay, do you need anything? He made a pact with himself that if one person did, he wouldn't do it. Um, and we hear that a lot, how, how ambivalent people are in the moments before that I think a lot of people don't realize their own impact, that if you just even make eye contact with a cashier at the grocery store that day and ask them how they're doing, that could be it. That could be the thing. And so making eye contact, asking someone how they're doing and meaning it, um, we hear that all the time, that that would have made a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you. This isn't the easiest subject in the world to deal with. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. The Attorney General unequivocally supports this bill and supports the waiting period. We view it in our office as a clear as especially suicide prevention, we view it as a clear public health and public safety issue, and this is a bill that addresses a vital and important public health and public safety concern. Um, I'm sure the committee has heard from, just did hear from, and will hear more from clinicians and public health experts that um, can delve more deeply into the statistics than, um, than we can and have more expertise than we do, but certainly the headline numbers around Suicide by firearm are compelling. Um, Vermont has uh, one point, I believe it's 1.5 times the rate of suicide by firearm as compared to the nation, three times as compared to other northeastern states. Uh, the lethality of firearm use in suicide attempts is, a, is enormously higher than suicide attempts without firearms. It's something like um, According to one study, 5% of uh, suicide attempts without firearms will result in death, whereas 85% of gun suicide attempts result in death, as was just discussed uh, by the prior witness. The uh, anecdotal and data shows that um, people who are not successful in a suicide attempt are fairly unlikely to attempt it again. So that lethality number uh, brings a finality to something that um, would not necessarily be final without the access to a firearm. Um, <clears throat> in states that have waiting period laws, uh, I believe it's 51% uh, fewer fire, those states have 51% fewer firearm suicides and 27% lower overall suicide rate than states without those laws. So this is, this, there certainly is a strong correlation between waiting period laws and lowering suicide rates. Um, in Vermont, one interesting piece of data that we've heard from, or that I should say was sort of compiled by a, um, somebody who's in pediatric critical care, Vermont has lower than average prevalence uh, in terms of the rate of youth reporting severe depressive symptoms, suicidal planning, and suicide attempts. However, um, there is a higher than average sui youth suicide death rates when compared to other states, which speaks to that lethality issue um, that Vermont perhaps doesn't, you know, has a psychological, the, the population wise has a psychological challenge that is no greater and probably maybe less than we see other places, but because of access to firearms, uh, there does seem to be a correlation there, not causation, regarding um, lethality in suicide attempts. So for all those reasons, and those what we believe are very compelling statistics, we do support this bill and support the waiting period, and believe it's an important public health and public safety measure for us <coughs> to uh, embrace and pass into law. Um, so I, I know there's a lot of talk about suicide relating to this bill, but 
it'll also inevitably have an impact on crime as well, whether it's domestic violence or trading firearms for drugs. I was wondering if you could provide any perspective on how it may impact those issues as well. The belief is that it will affect both of those issues. We, I, I should say I, I, I bet there are other people. <laughs> we are less able to find specific data that really points to that reduction with this particular type of statute. However, it certainly seems from <clears throat> the types of cases we prosecute, in particular with regards to guns for drugs type of case, types of cases, <coughs> those are often cases where people um, are coming um, going to a store, getting firearms rapidly, turning that around, as you know in your other job. Um, I'm sure you've had experience with those types of cases. Um, and that this could put a break on those issues. Make, putting up that barrier could put a break on that type of crime. Uh, with regard to domestic violence, again, very compelling data with regard to the lethality of having a weapon in the home. Um, I believe about half of the homicides in Vermont every year are um, domestic violence related homicides and a little bit more than half of those are homicides that are firearm homicides. Murder suicides I think are something like 75% uh, firearm um, related. So anytime you put a break on access to firearms, and um, there should be a corresponding reduction in lethality of some of these crimes that we're talking about. Uh, we do believe from a constitutional standpoint, just to bring that forward, um, that there's no question that this is within the state's regulatory power to make public safety judgments about how to keep people safe. It does not impede on either Second Amendment rights or the Vermont Constitution. Um, and so we see no concern there. As with the bills that were passed last year, uh, Vermont has a compelling interest in protecting public safety, and there is the data here is compelling. Uh, yeah, just real quick, the 51% fewer suicides by firearms in states with waiting periods. What was the other figure for all suicides? I believe you may be referring to the 27% lower overall <coughs> suicide rate. Yeah. So, do you have? Is that from a study that you can get us a, it is, a citation I, to that? Yeah, I can get you that um, citation. Okay. I don't have it right off the top. I have notes that don't have the citation with them, but I will uh, get you that citation. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. David, I just wondered what your opinion is on the John Hopkins Bloomberg. School of Public Health and the University of California Davis Violence Prevention Research Program that found California's uh, um, the study from California, which is probably the most comprehensive study done around this subject, showed that there is no changes in suicides. And you're talking about it was a study that was specifically about um, a waiting period the and, and the waiting uh, period. background checks also. What was the date of it? <coughs> when was that study done? Uh, it just came out in December. It was it was done in published in December or when was the study? Uh, the date they started uh, as far as the dates they started in 1991 when uh, California implemented the programs. So I'd want to take a look at it before I hazard yeah. an answer. I mean I the data we see are from reputable um, peer-reviewed journals and I think it's reliable data yeah. uh, and as I said uh, compelling data but I will take a look at that and, and learn more about that. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, John Campbell, Executive Director for the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you for having me here today. Um, this is a bill, actually, unfortunately, I, uh, as many of you know, that my daughter uh, teaches at Parkway uh, Middle School, which is right next to Parkland High School, and she lost three of her former students uh, in the Parkland Massacre, and uh, actually just lost another one, a relative of one of her students, uh, a young lady who killed herself this past week. 
Um, so this is a this is a topic that uh, unfortunately just comes up and, and uh, is in your face all, way too often. And uh, I can tell you before I go into this, again, many of you also know that I have background as a police officer down in Florida. Unfortunately for Florida, unfortunately for Vermont, where you know it was a situation where uh, down there we often saw violent crimes and uh, and all too often a lot of those were suicides. So I have personal experience of what it's like to uh, go to a house uh, where somebody has taken their own life uh, by firearms and by other methods. But I can tell you when it's done by a firearm, it is one of the uh, saddest moments, not just for you know, a responder to the scene, but also to family members um, when they come in. Of course, you try to prevent them from coming into the scene, but it's amazing uh, the feelings that are, are shown by some of these folks in saying, what did they miss? You know, what could they have done to have prevented this? Why is their child, why is their husband, why is their wife lying in a bed in a pool of blood? And um, so the, uh, the, the thought of uh, taking one's life, and, and again, we're talking specifically about firearms here, is is a very difficult one and, and I you know I know the data that you're, you're gonna find data that shows yes maybe their waiting periods could help maybe they couldn't uh, maybe uh, background checks help maybe they don't um, just as anything else I think you can find data to fit in whatever you want but it really comes down to this in, in my mind is that you're talking about lives and all too often lives of our young or of our children those precious things that we have. And if we as a legislative, well, you all as a legislative body, have the ability to do something to stop it, to discourage it, even one life, you've done something really important. And we just can't turn our, turn away from the fact that yeah, these things happen in life, and yes, you know, we don't want to infringe on people's rights to have own weapons. Um, that is something that this country is, you know, since it was uh, first started, people have weapons and they're going to continue to have them. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't take steps that we know or we feel that will, in fact, help. And I can't help but to think. And actually, I feel I can positively say that there are often times where if a person did not have a firearm next to them, if they had, they probably would not have done what they ultimately did do. Now, oftentimes we find a lot of the people, uh, victims of suicides, we find that they were, these are back in the day, um, heavily intoxicated um, or on drugs, mostly intoxication. And it's one of those things where if the gun wasn't there, the event would not have happened, at least at that time. And then people will say, well, if they didn't do it by a gun, they could have found another way to do it. And you know, it's pretty unlikely as far as I'm concerned with these people, because again, they're in a highly intoxicated state, whether it's from, and they're depressed, or whether there's been a, uh, uh, some of the personal issue that happened, um, they have something that's readily available that they know that they can do, and it's going to be over like that. It's not going to be like, okay, I got to wait and take some pills and, you know, wait, go to fall asleep or whatever. They, this is something that's right there. And when they make that, that commitment to take that gun in their hand and pull the trigger, that's it. It's just like when you know, who was talking about jumping off the, the Golden Gate Bridge. I often said living in Quichi, and unfortunately we've had many suicides down in Quichi Gorge. I, I have often said is that how many of the people, once they step off, do they say, oh my God, what did I just do? You can't take it back. That guy's a lucky guy, and you know, that he survived. But anyway, I guess I'm, I'm preaching more than I'm testifying here, so I'll stop that. But uh, I can just tell you that I think anything that you all do as a committee and you all do as a legislature that can help give even just a little bit of time for somebody to think before they act. Um, 
you're doing something so important and you're going to save lives. Can't tell you how many, but to me, there's one person. If it was one of your sons, your daughters, sisters, brothers, parents, doesn't matter. You saved a life. So, one suggestion, and I'll get back to the bill. Uh, I don't know if this has been discussed before. Uh, this actually goes back to my old hat as a civil attorney. You're, uh, and that is uh, providing the, um, maybe the transfer by uh, legally executed will or lawfully executed will. I would probably, okay. unless somebody has said something, I probably would have used that uh, testamentary, testamentary instrument because you can, not wills aren't the only ways you can do it. You can do it by trust and the other uh, agreement. So, I just want to find where you are. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's in the uh, first page yeah. under C1A. Yeah. It says immediate family members to another immediate family member by a lawfully executed will. Yeah, I guess I would put lawfully executed. Testament. Testament. Yeah, testamentary instrument is what I would have suggested. Okay. Great. And the only other thing that I think we could, t uh, from our standpoint, we do, the uh, state attorneys do support the uh, waiting period. And um, whether 24 hours is enough, that's that's obviously a policy decision. If it was up to me, it would be longer, but that's just my own personal opinion. I can't say that that is something that I have a collective uh, opinion of the state's attorneys. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. The okay, so thank you. So we're going to start with Mr. Brown, please. And um, so we do have a hard stop at at uh, three thirty, um, absolute latest, because uh, just give everybody a break before the before the hearing. So, yeah. Great. Welcome. Thank you. For the record, uh, my name is Jeffrey Wallen. I'm the director of the Vermont Crime Information Center with the Department of Public Safety. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and briefly. Uh, chat with the committee uh, and each of you today. What I want to do hopefully is primarily answer any questions folks have, but I'll begin by just making a brief um, overview from my perspective of how uh, firearm checks are conducted for individuals purchasing a firearm in Vermont through a licensed dealer. I would like to say that the, uh, the uh, VCIC does not actually conduct these checks. These are conducted in Vermont by the Federal Bureau of Investigation in their national instant background check system. Uh, occasionally we do provide some clarification to them if they have a question or there's an open docket, etc. We may help them run down some information, but we do not do the determinations in our office if someone is eligible to receive a firearm or not. Those again are handled by the FBI um, for any transactions in Vermont. Essentially how it works is if an individual were to go to um, a licensed firearm dealer and uh, I'll let you imagine whatever one you want to choose for that. Uh, you simply go there, you select the firearm you'd like to purchase, you then complete a questionnaire uh, that has primarily moved to an online process now where they um, may ask for your ID to verify, verify your identity, complete some information online, submit that, and then within no more than a couple of minutes for most transactions, they're going to receive um, either a proceed that, that that transaction may move forward, they're going to receive a deny that that individual is prohibited from purchasing a firearm at this time, or they may be asked to hold that for three days because it's inconclusive and the FBI needs to do additional research uh, on that. And that's essentially how, how the process works. It used to be a form you filled out and you either called or faxed it to the FBI. Now the majority of these are done um, through an online portal that the FBI has established for federal firearms dealers. So let's say it's not an established gun shop, but a gun show. Uh, we'll, what will be the difference? Um, I'm not aware of how at a gun show it would be done. If those okay. individuals are not running the check through a firearms dealer, um, through the FBI, I'm not sure what, if any, um, check they would be doing. Thank you. Um, are you familiar with the UPINs, the unique, unique personal identification number, which as I understand it, and maybe you can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, uh, it's folks who have taken the initiative upon themselves, I think you have to get uh, law enforcement uh, fingerprints, you go through some sort of a background check, 
and you then have this number, so when you're filling out the 4473, you put in your U pins, and it, I believe, doesn't have you go through the background check in the same way, and I, I've had some back and forth and I can't recall, but I just, my question to you would be, are you familiar with that, and are you aware how many people in Vermont have that status currently? I'm not familiar with that particular process because we don't administer that in our office. Um, so we, we're not aware of what, if anything, goes into that. And I couldn't then comment on the number of individuals in Vermont that may have signed up for some kind of service like that. So, so the uh, category of uh, if it's put on, on hold because it's inconclusive, uh, do, does the, is it the FBI that's doing this, the ATF? Who, who is it that's doing the further? Examination. Typically, the, so if, if there's an inconclusive result to the initial check, um, that means there's some information that isn't definitive um, that would disqualify an individual. So they typically have up to three days to do that. And typically, it's the FBI that does that, the, the National Incident uh, Background Check System that does that. Uh, that's when we may actually get involved. For example, if they see someone was arrested and arraigned for a felony, but there's no disposition, they weren't found guilty, not guilty, et cetera, et cetera. They may reach out to us to go, hey, can you help us run this down and we can connect them with the court uh, in, of jurisdiction to find out what happened so they can make a determination there. We simply act as a conduit for information, but they have up to three days uh, to make that determination. Uh, and what happens after those three days? Does the FBI still work with you to figure it out eventually? And does it just drop at three days, or does it continue it, on until it resolves the question? It's my understanding that after three days that the dealer may release that firearm to the individual. Right. I'm not aware, um, personally, if they continue to research it or not. We typically provide whatever information we have as quickly as possible. We're not made aware if, the ultimate, if it's ultimately a proceed or a deny, or if they're approved or not. We simply help them connect the information. We're not actually given the results of the check because we're not, again, we're not really party to that. Um, so I'm not sure what would happen if it took longer than three days to get that or what any potential outcomes if that firearm was transferred and was later found to be ineligible. And the three days is, where does three days come from? Uh, that's from the federal statute that, that establishes a national instant, um, instant background check system, which is almost always instant, but not in every instance. <coughs> Could you just let me know who might be your counterpart at ATF who would be able to tell me more about the UPINs? Um, I'm not, I actually don't have a personal contact with the ATF. I can certainly reach out to them and let them know the committee is interested in chatting with them and, and connect them, but I actually don't have a particular counterpart there. But I'd be happy to do that. Kimberly, were you asking for that kind of feeding off of Martin's question, what happens at the no, details. no, actually, um, it was just something that was brought to my attention, um, and I'm just trying to um, solicit folks' opinions about it. Right. I wonder if the same person may be able to um, answer Martin's question, kind of what happens after the yeah, three days, yeah. no, which is, or at the three-day point, which is kind of interesting. I can certainly pass that pass that along. Uh, I'm not sure if the ATF or the FBI, I'm not sure who the responsible agency, but I can reach it. I do have a, 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 the number of folks um, at the ATF I can reach out to to find out, and they can coordinate that. They obviously, the ATF and the FBI work very closely together on firearms-related issues. Um, so I'd be happy to reach out to them and, and see what I can, what, what, who I can, um, for lack of a more delicate term, wrangle up that may be able to answer some of those questions. Because again, we don't do that in our office, and I wouldn't want to speak for them. But it sounds like after those three days, that the, the three days is when it's complete, is that? Well, after, after the three days, um, they, the, the FBI um, has three days to make a final determination. After that, the dealer may then release that firearm to the individual, even if no determination has been made. What's not clear to me is if they later determine on day four or day five it was an, el in, an ineligible transfer, what happens? I don't know, I mean, because we're not actually directly involved in that. If they put it on hold and then day one or day two, they determine, oh, actually, it's fine. It's a different Jeffrey Wallen, just someone with a similar name and date of birth. Then they contact the dealer and say, yes, you may proceed. Um, or if it's denied, oh, it is the same Jeffrey Wallen. He's got three felony convictions for 
take your pick. Um, I don't have any, by the way, so just to be clear. <laughs> but uh, if we're to have any, um, then it's denied, and then it's a denial, and you may not release that. It's only if it goes three days and they can't make a final determination that it becomes a gray area. So just to be clear, I could walk out of here tonight. I have to go to a gun dealer, and they could have something on me, and I couldn't, I couldn't purchase a gun. Well, the gun dealer wouldn't necessarily have anything on you, but the FBI um, would have information and available. They would have it, and they could <coughs> deny that sale of a gun to me. Correct. 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 Interesting. And actually, um, are you able to talk about the different categories, the denials? Um, I think you referenced it earlier, but mm -hmm. but prohibited persons or prohibited. Oh, sure. Um, so, so thank you for that, that yeah. clarifying statement. Uh, again, because we don't do the evaluations in our office, however, I can speak generally to a couple of things. Um, there are a number of categories as established um, that, at the federal level, that, that would prohibit someone from receiving or purchasing a firearm. Uh, the most common ones are a conviction of a felony, a criminal conviction of a felony, but there are also some other ones, uh, such as if you're dishonorably discharged from the military, if you voluntarily give up your United States citizenship. Uh, if you're um, a known or suspected terrorist, you would be denied purchasing the firearm. So there are things, that, other categories out there that may exist. If you have a, a, a what we would consider a protection order or a relief from abuse order that prohibited the individual from some purchasing firearms, that would be entered and made available as well. Is that? Yeah, but pretty much. Just yeah. one more. Yeah. So, so that's already out there on the computer or something like that. That the, yes, sir. these. All these regulations are already out there and they're posted. Well, the regulations are out there and they're, and they're posted. However, if an individual goes to a firearm dealer, the dealer is not making a determination whether or not the gun can be sold or not. It goes to the FBI as a criminal justice entity. They have access to a lot of data, and they would, they would based on the name and date of birth and the other, like, if you provide a social, et cetera, driver's license number, they can, with a high degree of confidence, say, this is or is not the person who has five felony convictions that we know of right here. They are denied. and that will typically come back very, very quickly if it's a clear case. Or if there's absolutely no, this person has no information at all, there's nothing with this person's name or date of birth or other unique identifiers in the system, it comes back very quickly as a proceed that, that you can release that. Thank you. Kimberly, yeah. My question is, um, when you reference the do not fly list, we know from media reports anyway, that there's a certain error rate, and people have had you know, various stories about their name resembling folks who are on a do not fly list. And my question is, what is the presumed error rate of the NICS system? I'm not aware of any presumed error rate. Um, I'm not sure what a do not fly list is either. There is a file that the FBA maintains. It's a known or suspected terrorist, so I don't believe that has anything to do with the flying or not, per se. Your, your um, wording, I'm sure, is um, better than mine in terms of what it's called, but and, for the vernacular. And we don't, and we, we, again, we don't enter individuals on that, but it's something that went to the, the FBI um, or other federal entities are, are, are uh, curious about someone's movement, um, and they have, again, it's a substantiated entry into that that they may be flagged. Um, I'm not sure, I can't speak to what any error rate may or may not be because we're not involved in that in that piece. I do know the vast majority of checks um, based on information I've received from the FBI um, and from folks at the NICS section, the vast majority of, of, of attributions or requests are either approved or denied very, very quickly within, again, within minutes. Um, and it's well over 90% are approved or denied very, very quickly. If someone is denied, um, then they receive information from the FBI stating the uh, reason for the denial and where the record came from. So, for example, if someone had a felony conviction in Vermont and that was the reason why they were denied, it would say contact the Vermont Crime Information Center as the repository and we can say, oh, because you have these three felony convictions. And if they say, that's not me, then we can work with them to either value, evaluate that and sometimes remind them of something they did back in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, or 2000s for that matter. Or that there, if there was, and it's very rare, but if there was an issue, help them get that corrected with the courts. So. If, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. If I had a dishonorable discharge, a felony, give give up my U.S. citizenship, and you named a, a few other things, is it against the law for me to, to go try and buy a gun? That I can't comment on because we we as the repository we simply maintain the data that others use for this. 
I would encourage you to talk to the federal or okay. What's that? It's so, for you to possess it. Okay. That would be that would be a federal and now depending on the conviction it could be a state crime as well because you passed that two years ago. But possession or transfer. But I mean I don't think the attempt to purchase would be what Okay. What, it depends on what you would put in your application because the application has a provision that you have to swear that everything you've said is true, right. and if you haven't, it okay. is <laughs> fraud could potentially be a yeah. potential issue if you falsify it. Actually, so here's another question. I don't know if this is on the form, but I remember looking at one, and isn't there a question on there about cannabis consumption, and what about states where mm -hmm. cannabis is legal? I believe there is a question that asks individuals to indicate if they're using any federally controlled substances, and I believe they did add a rider um, or a clarification that if you are using cannabis in a state that allows it, it's still illegal at the federal level, and because these are federal laws, um, they do ask folks to indicate that. So, so uh, VCIC provide, are, are you the provider of information into the system from from our state, I mean, for convictions and such? For, for criminal events, yes. For civil events, for example, if someone is found to be uh, not competent to stand trial or they're committed against, uh, against uh, uh, their will per se, uh, that would be the judici judiciary, excuse me, the judiciary that provides that information because it's not criminal um, in nature. So, But if it's a conviction, et cetera, that does come from our office, yes. So how, how quick of a turnaround is it to get somebody on there and to get somebody off? Of the well, we receive weekly updates from the judiciary as far as updates to convictions, etc. So as soon as we get the information, we'll update that. Uh, and it's, it's um, I don't want to say real time, but it's minutes from when we get it and we upload it, we process it, we check it, and then it's available um, for that piece. If there's a question, um, we do have, I do have a staff five days a week, um, eight to five, that are available to answer any questions that the, that the FBI might have. So if they have a question, about something, we'll respond within one business day um, and minimum um, to provide that information uh, to them. We can also, if there's a, uh, if we get a, a fax or a call from the court, hey, this person was just uh, convicted of this and the judge wants you to know immediately, we can update it immediately and we can update that information. It doesn't happen very often, but occasionally we may get a fax over a disposition sheet and we'll go ahead and manually update that rather than waiting for the weekly update. So, okay, so can we, the reason I ask is that we have. Uh, we established the extreme risk protection order. Correct. And, and that would, sounds like that would go through the court, not through VCIC. But right now, I don't know that those are being provided to uh, the mixed system. Uh, that might be just something that we may have to look at, unless you know something. Well, the extreme risk protection orders are handled like a protection order. They're not a criminal conviction, et cetera. Um, so they're handled like a protection order. So they're entered into the National Crime Information Center the same way any other protection order would be. And within that, there is language that says the individual, either temporary or permanently, um, is barred while this order is in effect from receiving a firearm. It's up to the FBI to, to see that and act on it and deny that particular action. But we do make that available. So that does come through VCIC? It doesn't come through VCIC now, but I'm just aware of those because they use systems that we manage and maintain, but we actually don't see the orders ourselves. And, and what is this? I'm sorry, what, what's the system, the federal? <coughs> Well, those are entered into NCIC or the so, National so it Crime. So it is in the Correct. background check. Correct. Yes, it would okay. be. It would be in that process. So Urkels are entered in there. They are presumably taken off as soon as. Correct. Lifted. As with any other protection right. order, really from abuse order, they're handled the same right. way. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, did we cut you off? Or no, 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 no. Okay. No. Any other questions I can answer for? And I will reach out to my uh, contacts at the ATF about the the and see if I can get some information or someone that can speak to that more authoritatively. Because again, I don't want to misspeak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we have a hard stop at three thirty. Um, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ed Cutler. I'm here representing the Gun Owners of Vermont. 
an organization representing oh about 6,800 people right now. Um, first you have thing 6,800 members. Hmm? 6,800 members you have. Yep. Paid members. I'm curious, you said paid how much? 6,800 members. Yeah, and, and how much is? How much $20 a year. Um, before I Whoops. start. Help. Just push the button again. I'll push the button. Push it again. I'm a computer idiot, sorry about this, but okay. Yep. Okay. Well, before I actually start my testimony, I would like to play a short video. Um, it has something to do with suicide, which is what this bill seems to be all about. So this wasn't done by us, this was done by somebody else. have found no measurable statistical effects on gun deaths following the implementation of waiting period laws. One study published in 2000 in the Journal of the American Medical Association indicated that these policies may be associated with a small reduction in the rate of gun suicide for those age 55 and older, but noted increases in other suicide methods in a possible substitution effect, resulting in no reduction in the rate of suicide overall. In contrast to the broad body of research, one 2017 study, often cited by gun control proponents, claims that waiting period laws applied exclusively to handguns caused a 17% reduction in gun homicides and a 7 to 11% reduction in gun suicides. In peer review, it has been noted that this study failed to account for relevant variables, relied upon statistical comparisons geographically rather than temporally to determine effect, and measured change cumulatively over periods of time rather than looking for the statistical cliff that should be evident with a policy whose full effect would become apparent within the length of the waiting period itself. The vast majority of research done on the subject is in agreement that these policies cannot be shown to have caused any decrease in firearm-related deaths, and a report from the Center for Disease Control found insufficient evidence for any determination that waiting periods measurably impact firearm fatalities, noting the inconsistent evidence of effectiveness and limitations in design and execution of available studies. But the purpose of the proposal in Vermont is really limited to preventing suicide. When we look at the numbers at the national level, the greatest correlation with suicide rate is not the extent of gun control laws. It's population density. The suicide rate in the United States is 14 per 100,000. Vermont's is higher than average, at 17.2. But if you controlled for Vermont's demographic makeup and the high proportion of populations at increased risk for suicide, it is actually about average. But how much could a waiting period decrease Vermont's suicide rate? According to the CDC, there were 1,308 suicides in Vermont between 2005 and 2018. During that time, the number of reported cases of the method of suicide being a firearm purchased the same day was one. Vermont is suffering through a mental health care shortage of crisis proportions. Vermonters wait months or years for appointments with mental health care professionals. Vermonters in crisis seek care through hospital emergency departments, and some have been turned away 
returned home and killed themselves or others. In the absence of mental health care facilities to meet community needs, our emergency departments are so overcrowded with mental health patients for whom no other space can be found that people suffering massive internal bleeding from car accidents have waited several life-threatening hours for a physician to triage them, and scheduled surgeries have been postponed indefinitely. There is enormous room for improvement in this area, and the legislature has the power to act decisively. That the primary suicide prevention effort in a state with woefully inadequate mental health care resources is a misguided gun control law with over $56,000 in lobbyist spending behind it in the first two months of this year alone, which under the best of circumstances can only impact seven one hundredths of one percent of Vermont suicides is immoral, inhumane, and profane under the circumstances. So what can be done? The Vermont Suicide Prevention Center has a list of recommendations, which include building integrated mental health and suicide prevention infrastructure, improving access and coordination of mental health and substance abuse services, and development of programs to promote social and emotional wellness, and provide training to community members and professionals on how to recognize suicide-related behaviors and how to intervene. All of these are within the power of the legislature, but many of them will cost money. Other recommendations can be implemented quickly and inexpensively. These include the Gunshot Project, a cooperative initiative between the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center and the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs to educate firearms retailers about the signs of a person in crisis. It is also recommended that the media be careful about how and how much they report on the issue of suicide. More than 50 studies have found that certain types of news coverage can increase the likelihood of suicide in vulnerable individuals, resulting in suicide contagion or copycat suicides. The media recommendations include avoid big and sensational headlines and prominent placement of suicide in the story. Avoid including photos of the method of death and grieving family and friends. Avoid describing recent suicides as an epidemic skyrocketing, or other strong terms. Avoid describing a suicide as inexplicable or without warning. Avoid quotes or interviews about the causes of suicide with non-experts in suicide prevention. But what about us? What can we do? The most important thing is to educate ourselves about suicide. Studies show that suicide very rarely occurs without warning. One event in a person's life cannot explain the complex causes of suicidal behavior. Common explanations for suicide are isolation, stressors, inability to seek help from loved ones or from mental health professionals, and lack of access to mental health services. With education about what to look for, friends, family, and even a person who is or may become in crisis can intervene, making suicide preventable and the underlying issues treatable. Here are some of the warning signs of suicide. Please go to the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center's website and learn more about suicide as a public health issue and about how to get involved in suicide prevention in Vermont. If you or someone you know is displaying any of these warning signs, here are some things you can do to get help. If you believe there may be an immediate cause for concern because you or someone you know is depressed or having thoughts of self-harm, Call 1-800-273-TALK or text VT to 741-741. Take care of yourselves, Vermonters, and take care of one another. Um, we have actually gone beyond the gun shop project. We have taken gatekeepers. Uh, program which uh, taught us to look at people who were suicidal and we've done a number of other programs that have actually saved lives. <laughs> I hate these things. <laughs> Unplug it. <laughs> wouldn't do any um, Anyway, we have actually saved we have actually saved lives through our program. Um, it's a beautiful system. I personally have saved three lives. People that were depressed, 
they came to me, they talked to me. One person I spent the whole night just sitting and listening to. The problem is, is these waiting periods would be very detrimental to the uh, programs that we are now doing. The background checks really gave us a kick, but these waiting periods are gonna be even worse. I've taken in guns from people who were contemplating stuff like that. With a waiting period, legally I can't do that. With the background checks, people are not giving them to me because we have to go to a dealer. And then there's a record, and a lot of people are afraid of that record. 20 years down the road, being turned over to the police or whatever happens, and it, it, it's happened in New York City, it's happening in California. California, they actually have gun police that go around confiscating people's weapons because they're registered. So this kind of a system and this bill, <coughs> as far as the waiting periods, should be killed, just eliminated completely. The um, Rogers amendments we think are a great thing and we think they ought to go through. I think there ought to be more added to the, the Rogers Amendments. But regardless of what happens with the Rogers Amendments, the most important thing to do is no waiting periods, no lock up your guns. And I know that the committee or some people on the committee are contemplating that. I'd also ask, like to answer a couple of questions that were asked from uh, the previous speaker. One of the barring facts from purchasing or owning a firearm is if you have a medical marijuana card. <clears throat> On the 4473, which is the ATF questionnaire, it specifically says um, if you have a medical marijuana card and you use it, you are prohibited from owning a firearm or a single bullet. So it's not just felons. And many of you on here are attorneys. A felon isn't a murderer, a mugger, or a thief, it's also a traffic violator. So all those felonies are barring people in this state from having firearms. Okay? Now, I'm gonna give you a list of people who have actually saved people, saved their lives, and defended themselves right in here in the state of Vermont. And there's a lot more of these people than there are Per, a person purchasing a firearm, going out and instantly shooting themselves, okay? And these are actually, I put an ad up for this Saturday morning. I had 50 responses. I'm only gonna give you a few of them. Bill DeCosmo from Brattleboro defended a woman from abusive husband. He held his gun, didn't shoot it, and let the guy know he had a firearm. The guy instantly left. Luke Martin from Putney. Someone tried to jack his head, his uh, car at the Putney Sunoco. I think you know where that is. Um, he had a handgun, no shots fired, but he let the guy know that he had a handgun. The guy took off. Joshua Jones in Dummerston had a drawn, fired, and an aggressive dog. So this isn't just people, this is animals too. He fired into the ground and the dog ran off. Trini Brassard of Randolph had to buy a firearm to keep an abusive, abusive spouse away. No shots were fired, but once she had that firearm, he has never bothered her again. Jim O'Malley from Ludlow had to fend off looters during a blackout at his store with a firearm again. No shots fired. Ross Satcher of Starksboro had to draw a handgun during a road rage incident. No shots were fired. Eric John of Barrytown had to hold the drug driver in his yard with a firearm. Um, the uh, drunk driver went after him with a tire iron. He held him off with a firearm. Greg DeMars of Winnesaki was confronted by a drunk, pointed the revolver at a drunk, and the drunk ran away. Again, no shots fired. I'm not gonna go into the rest of these. You, you all have a sheet, but 
understand that 99% of all self-defense situations, shots are not fired. It's more of a warning. Um, this is typical, not only in Vermont, this is typical nationwide. Now, to my actual testimony. Sure. Sure. Uh, I hate to be the devil's advocate here, but so all those examples you just gave, uh, how would they be affected by this bill? Um, the lady who was uh, being uh, molested by her abusive husband went instantly. She issued an, uh, an, a restraining order. She knew he was coming back. She went and bought a firearm. He knew that she had that firearm. That was what the, the lady was on your list? Yeah, that was, uh, here. I'm trying to keep all these names in my head. Right. Um, Susan Blair Scaglione. Trini Brassard, and uh, she's from Randolph. Okay. But she literally had a TRO on the guy, and like most TROs, it's a piece of paper. It doesn't do anything. Um, I have a number of instances of stuff like that where women have gone out, bought firearms, and was never bothered again by their abusive spouses. So this is not something that's rare, it's something that's actually quite normal. Okay. Just, I, I want to make sure that uh, you know, the record's clear on this because I don't want you to not be taking other friends' uh, firearms away from them if there's a, a suicide issue or you're some concern, you suggested that you couldn't do that anymore. Uh, but that's not the case. I want to make very clear that the background check uh, does not apply to a person who transfers the firearm to another person in order pr to prevent imminent harm to any person. So uh, just, you know, future, take away the handguns, take away the firearms. It, I mean, the, the background check doesn't apply in that situation. Okay. So one person um, helping now. I've had his firearms for six months. How long is temporary? For as long as the uh, threat uh, is in existence. I mean, okay. if, if you continue to feel this person is uh, you well, know under threat, now I can't see. That's a transfer right. by federal statute. A transfer. I'm required to go to an FFL with him now to return his firearms, to transfer them back. Yeah, that's not how the, the law applies in that situation. So so you should, uh, I'm just saying, if, if you're in that situation again, you should not hold off on mm. taking some of these firearms okay. because the, stuff, the background so check not. doesn't apply on those kind of transfers. Um, you know, so I, I, you can go ahead. I, I hate to say it, but I do hear of things like that happening, where people can um, I know, well, just uh, yesterday somebody was released um, from the self-defense situation, the guy that shot the two guys in the thing. Now, I don't want to have to spend thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to clear my name, if you understand what I'm saying. Lawyers are expensive. Believe me, I know how expensive they can be. So I'm not going to take the chance of somebody coming along and saying, you're under arrest. We have an attorney general who's making a case out of a minor magazine violation right now. Um, the state's attorney in Bennington didn't want to do it. The cops in Bennington didn't want to do it. He made it his own personal vendetta. Now here I am, cursing the ground he walks on. No offense, but if he had a chance to go after me, don't you think he would? And I'm not a paranoid person. That's just what the way he seems to be. Mark, so, was that federal law you were calling? No, it was, it was, it was uh, the state. Yeah. Okay. Well, federal law, I can hand anybody that's a legal person a firearm by federal statute. This is Vermont statute, but I'm not going to take the chance. Um, on the lockup, okay, on the lockup the gun part. What is in your immediate control? If I'm at the range, I know you're thinking about it, but it's not written yet, but if I'm up at the range and I gotta go 200 yards down range to put up a new target, 
No club in the world will allow you to walk down range with a firearm. You leave them on the bench, there's an officer there to watch them, and you go down range and change your targets. That's no longer in my immediate possession. So, so that has nothing to do with the bill sure. that we have. Okay, you're right. And if any such amendment comes forward, then you can comment on you know, later date. Okay, if an amendment comes forward, I hope you can have me back to speak about it. Okay. Just so, just watching the time. Okay. Excuse me. I'm, again, I'm just watching the time. As I said, we have a hard stop at 3:30. So a few times. Okay. Yeah. Well, you all have uh, my written testimony too. I hope you all read it. Uh, view this weekend if you can. Um, just down the street from here, give me a holler and let me give you my card and we can talk. Sure. Okay. Thank you, everybody.